I'm in Mark's gospel, chapter 11. So you might want to open up for just now. We're going to do this in pieces as we tell the story. And I want to start out this way. See, Jesus was born into this polluted, complicated religious world. If you take the book of Malachi, it's the last book in your Old Testament. You take Malachi and you finish it up and you close Malachi. And then you go through those little pages in between and you open the gospel according to Matthew you have this whole new religious world. Because things that were not found in Malachi, in the Old Testament, show up immediately in the Gospels. You have Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians, uh, Essenes. You have a well-developed and organized uh, group of people called scribes. You have uh, zealots and you have synagogues. All those things take place in that 400 years between the time you close the last verse of Malachi and you open the first verse of Matthew. And (laughs) with all these religious people and all these religious systems in place during Jesus' ministry, Jesus is often accused, uh, he likes to spend time with tax gatherers and sinners. Yeah, absolutely. He loved spending time with people who knew they were lost instead of religious people who didn't know, but thought they had it all together because they were so very religious. And so that's the world Jesus comes to minister in. These religious leaders, in those 400 years in between Malachi and Matthew, they developed this complicated system of religious laws, and they had 613 of them. They had 613 of them, not for any great biblical reason, but because they said, well, let's see, if we take the Ten Commandments, in the Hebrew text, there's 613 letters in the Ten Commandments. So, let's come up with 613 laws from the Old Testament, so, uh, from, the, from the law. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, the books of the law, the books of Moses. So, 613 laws are going to come out of there. And then, they take those 613 that they've identified as these are the, these, these are the law, and they divided them up. And they said, well, let's say... Uh, 245 of these are positive commands. And uh, 365 of them are negative commands. And that means uh, it was based on the fact that they believe there were 240, what did I say, 40, 248 affirmative commands. The 248, because as they understood the human body, there were 248 different parts of the human body. So again, it's a really strong biblically based plan for why they had that many laws 365 negative commands the thou shalt not kind of things because you know 365 days in a year you just ought to be slapped in the face with don't do that every day so that's how they came up with with uh their their two sets of laws the positive and the negative and then they had things that were you absolutely have to do this commands and others that were elective out of the 613 like yeah this is the commands of god but you don't have to do this set over here Now, here's what happens. All those religious groups, what they do all day is they sit around arguing about, do we have the right 613 on the positives and the negatives and the you have to and you don't really have to commands? Do we have the right ones in the right group? And this is why those religious groups that I named earlier that you see all through the Gospels, they don't like each other. They hate each other. But the one thing they have in common is they all don't like Jesus because Jesus is getting right into the middle of all of their business. So we're going in this series through the week leading up to the cross and the resurrection. We're taking it, each Sunday, we're taking one of those days in that week. So last week, we talked about Monday. What happened on Monday? Jesus cleansed the temple. He goes into the temple. He said, this should be a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. And he turns over the tables of the money changer. He runs out the people who are buying and selling animals and everything else. He's, he stirred it up big. Now, he goes back to Bethany for the night. But he comes back Tuesday morning. And that's our context for today. And on Tuesday, he comes right back to the same temple where he stirred it up at that high of a level. And says, I'm going to start teaching again. Now, remember, the temple proper... The, the place where the sacrifices were done and the Holy of Holies and all that stuff, it could fit inside of this room, easily fit inside this room. But the temple complex as a whole, there's lots of courtyards and lots of areas where you could be tucked away. And so there were rabbis teaching over here, people praying over there, people just gathering and visiting because they came in from all over. And so it's a busy place, but Jesus has a piece of it, and he is teaching the people. 
right where all this is taking place. And now uh, he is going to be attacked. He's going to be bounced around from all sides by all these people. And you know why? The people loved him. You know why they loved him? Because they were caught in the middle of this tug of war over all those rules, all those laws, all this religious foolishness that had nothing to do with the relationship to God. It was all about a religious system. And they loved their system, but they didn't love God. And Jesus has turned things on its ear. The Bible says in Mark 11, verse 18, the chief priests and the scribes heard it, started looking for a way to kill him. Oh, they hated him, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was astonished by his teaching. So on Tuesday of Holy Week, Jesus' enemies began their attack here. Okay, so you, you turn over the tables of the money changers yesterday on Monday. Now it's Tuesday, and you're teaching and as it says multiple times in the gospel, he taught with authority. They ask him a big question. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the right to have a voice in this place? This is our place where we argue about all those laws, where we do our religious thing that we do. And Jesus just wasn't going to be pulled off sides by that. By what authority? The cross and the resurrection at the end of the week would forever declare the authority of Jesus Christ. All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth is what Jesus said. He is, uh, he's not a religious guru trying to create a lot of rules, regulations, and systems for you. He is one to be known and loved and followed and obeyed. He is the King and the Lord. Amen. We're in Mark chapter 12, and we're talking about the Tuesday. This Tuesday is, is incredible because Jesus is coming, and, and really at this time, the leaders, the religious leaders, they're, they're coming to ask these questions. This is where kind of the climax of what they feel like they can trap him in. One of my favorite passages of all time is in Mark chapter 12, and it's where the, the religious leaders come, and they question Jesus about whose authority that he has. And in and, and this, we see in Mark chapter 12, and I'm going to read the verses. It starts in verse 13. And this is an incredible story because I love it. Being a student minister, it's kind of one of those moments where he flips that coin to him and says, yeah, I got you. And you know, you think, oh my goodness, like Jesus totally had him. But there's so much richness to this story. And this is what it says in, in Mark chapter 12, verse 13. Then they, went, then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to trap him in his words. When they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you're truthful and don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God truthfully. They're feeding into that pride. They're trying to get him to be prideful in this moment. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought a coin. Whose image and inscription is this, he asked them. Caesar's, they replied. Jesus told him, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. Now, when we were talking about what, which one of these uh, stories we would take, I was like, I jumped on it to, to get this story. What I didn't realize is, as I got into it, this is a political story. So, and being that we're very politically, polariza the polarization of politics right now in our world, I was like, oh man. So, bear with me on this. The thing that I love about this story is that there was a political polarization. The thing about Scripture is, is sometimes we say, well, you know, this, this isn't relevant. This isn't something that uh, applies to us anymore. But the fact is, this applies to us very much so. Because political polarization isn't something that's new. We're living in that right now. But the fact is, Jesus lived in this political polarization of life as well. You see glimpses of this in Luke chapter 13. We see that Pilate had invited a bunch of Galileans to Jerusalem, and he invited them to be to partake in the sacrifice that they were going to do religiously. But what happened was, is Pilate ended up massacring all of these Galileans. And in Luke chapter 13, we see that the Jewish leaders are coming to Jesus, and they're saying, what about this massacre that Pilate took place? This is the same Pilate that Jesus would face eventually in his, in his death and resurrection. This is the same political leader, the Roman leader, and so you had this tension that was going on between Rome and the Jews at this time. And it was very, very tense. It was very tense, and, and it was a hot topic amongst all of the Jews. And so Jesus was constantly put into this position of trying to claim some political statement. 
We see it in John chapter 6 after the feeding of the 5,000. What ends up happening? It ends up happening that all the people are like, you know what, we want to take him and we want to take him as our king. And so they try to force Jesus as king and Jesus senses this and he disappears and he goes off. He goes off and he, he hides from him because he sees that the people are constantly wanting to force him into this political agenda that they had. And this is exactly what the Herodians and the Pharisees saw at this time is they wanted to come in and they wanted to make this a political thing. Because they knew if they could catch him, they knew that one of the most, um, one of the most explosive questions of the day was whether the Jews would pay the Roman poll tax. This was a big deal. Matter of fact, we see Barabbas, who is the one that was released at the time, was, was pretty much a terrorist, a Jewish terrorist, that he was going around and he was fighting the Roman government at the time. He was a part of a zealot group that was trying to fight this Roman poll tax. This was a hot topic, and so when they ask this question, they know that they have Jesus trapped. They, they sit there and they're like, we're going to get him trapped, because if he claims the Jews, then the Roman government's going to come in and tag him as one of these zealots. He's going to tag him as a political refugee, someone that's going to be against us. But if he sits there and he stands and says, pay your taxes, the Jews are going to pretty much disavow him, and then he loses his followers. And so they think that either way he's going he's gonna to sit there. And he says, Jesus told him, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. And they were utterly amazed at him. Why were they utterly amazed at him? And here's why they were. Jesus didn't deal with the political question. He saw it as a spiritual question. Just as the coin bore the image of Caesar, so man bears the image of God and has a responsibility to him. But that also means he has a responsibility to Caesar, the human government, because we see that in Romans 13, that it's instituted that we are to be a part of the government and to be a peacemaker in the government. It isn't an either-or situation, it is a both-and. And even the prophet Jeremiah told the people to work with the officials and seek to be peacemakers. In Jeremiah 29, we see that. We see in 1 Peter 2, 9-17 through 17 and 3, that Peter is talking about that we are to be peacemakers in the institution that God gave us the government. And so Jesus saw it as not this either or. He didn't see it as a fight. He saw it as a both and. But this is what he said. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And the image of God is what is placed on every one of us. Jesus was saying that the image of God is on you. And so give to God what is God's. And that is you. That is what God is saying in this. Is he saying, you know what? It, it's, it's there. Give it to Caesar. Give the money to Caesar. But I have come for something greater. And so what really mattered to, to the leaders at this time was they wanted this political agenda to be fixed. They were living in a time where they wanted the political dissolvent to happen because of the polarization that was going on between these two groups. But Jesus said, I have something greater. I have a greater purpose than what you are trying to force on me. And they were short-sighted, and what ended up happening was is that Jesus understood his mission, and his mission was that three days later he would die on the cross for all men, all men that carry God's image. And then three days after that he would be raised again so that we may have eternal life, so that all men may have eternal life, so that all men may have that opportunity to have him. And what he understood in that was it wasn't a political thing for him. It was a spiritual that he understood there's something greater eternally in him. And so he gave his life so that we all may have that eternal life. And through that eternal life, what ended up happening on earth is the church became the kingdom of God here on earth. And to this day, the church still stands, even though the, po the, the political agendas that were there 2,000 years ago, don't stand anymore. They're not there anymore. What the Jews were fighting was only a temporary thing, but what God was doing, what Christ was doing, was going to be for all eternity. And he said, what really matters most in this moment is not these political agendas you're throwing at me. What matters is the image of God on each man, and I have come to save your life, and I have given my life for you and raised so that you may have eternal life, adopted sons and daughters and that's what god gave us in that moment i uh i pick up where chris left off sometime later that day uh this is tuesday as chris mentioned and chad's mentioned i don't know if this is after lunch or not but the cross-examination begins and the next 
group of people come at Jesus, and this group is the Sadducees who begin to take their shot at Jesus. At this point, and Chad's alluded to this, this is very clearly a coordinated attack on Jesus. And hi Jewish historians tell us that these, as Chad mentioned, these groups don't get along. Uh, so they made an exception for Jesus. Jesus and his mission has an uncanny way of bringing the enemies of darkness together. And this week was no exception. So let's jump in. We're going to pick up where uh, Chris left off in Mark chapter 12, verse 18. Sometime later on that day, on Tuesday, the Sadducees, verse 18, who say there is no res resurrection, came to him and questioned him. Teacher. It's almost like they're, they're, they're kind of juicing him up, you know? Like, hey, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, whew, you're going to have to follow this one, leaving a wife behind but no child, that man should take the wife and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. Well, you've got to track with me here. The first married a woman and died, leaving no offspring. So he died. This woman married the brother, died, had no kids. The second took her, he died and left no kids, no offspring. And the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. You guys get this? None of the seven left offspring. Last of all, the woman died. Bless her heart. She, <laughs> that's a mercy on this family. My goodness. I mean, she's working through men pretty quick here. But, so, verse 23, this is where they go. Okay, Jesus, in the resurrection, when they rise, the resurrection of the dead, whose wife will she be since she had seven had married her? Phew. Verse 24 is Jesus' response to this crazy scenario. Jesus spoke to them. He says, isn't this the reason why you are mistaken? You don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, haven't you read? It's, I mean, can you just hear the sarcasm in his voice? Haven't you read the book of Moses, in the book of Moses? In the passage about the burning bush, how God said to him, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, who is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And then he ends with, again, you are badly mistaken. So in this encounter, the Sadducees are picking a fight with Jesus over the doctrine of the resurrection. Ironically, just the week before, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Most Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead, not this group. And so they create this bizarre, <laughs> absurd scenario of a woman marrying seven brothers, and they all died off. And then at the end, they try to get you kind of like a gotcha question. You ever seen that? You know, where some, somebody's kind of leading you. Politicians and attorneys are great at doing this. Jesus' response is incredibly direct and to the point and very clear. Look what he says. You are mistaken. In fact, he doesn't say you're mistaken. He says it twice. You're badly mistaken. That's how he ends this thing. Two, you're ignorant of Scripture. You don't know Scripture. Three, you're clueless to the power of God. Those two usually go hand in hand. Those are three things you never want to hear from the mouth of Jesus. The rest of the story is you. What we see the Sadducees doing here is an age-old tactic to attack the Scriptures where you pit one verse versus another, hoping that there's some illogical slip-up somewhere down line that would discredit the Scriptures and make Jesus look like a foolish, stupid person because he didn't think this through. And all they do in the process is really expose who they really are, that they have a low view of God, and they really don't know Scripture. You ever seen someone, they come at you, and their question is more of a commentary on them than it is you? And this is exactly what happens. So they attempt in this bizarre scenario, let me just go through it again, to uh, 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 pit the eventual resurrection of the, vet, of the dead and the high view of the institution of marriage and that ultimately down line, somewhere down line, that the scriptures and God didn't anticipate something or the scriptures couldn't unravel what this mess is going to create down line. It's like, God, you didn't think this through. 
Several years ago, I was teaching in a Sunday school class, and I was teaching on the new heaven and new earth. And I made the comment, just kind of off the cuff, like, we're, one day we're going to get our bodies back in a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to get new bodies. We're going to get renovated bodies. And I think some of you are like, well, which one am I going to get? The one at 17, 18, you know. I don't know. Well, I'm in, the, I'm in the teaching, and this guy raises his hand. And I'm like, yeah, what's up? And this guy was notorious for kind of like trying to catch me. And so he goes, all right, I got a scenario for you in this whole getting our bodies back thing. And I said, what's that? And he goes, what if someone dies at sea? Okay, I'm like, all right, this is interesting. And he gets eaten by a fish. I'm like, okay. And someone eats that fish. Very plausible scenario when you think two-thirds of the planet is covered by water. Someone's died in the ocean. I looked at my notes, and I was like, that's not in here. Uh, I don't know how to answer this guy. I just laughed at him. That guy had the same problem the Sadducees did. Do you think God's going to break a sweat over that one? He'll bring those molecules back together. How low of a view of God do you have? Have you not read Genesis chapter 1 where he, he creates everything? Just at the, his mouth and he just creates it? I'm like, come on. You have a low view of God. And, you know, we all do that at some times in our, our lives. But Jesus does something very remarkable here that he rarely does when people are throwing pot shots at him. He reveals something new about the next age that, as far as I know, has never been revealed anywhere in Scripture up until this point. He reveals in the next age that the redeemed um, will be like angels in respect that there will be no need for marriage. Whatever purpose marriage served in this, this age, procreation, companionship, sanctification, that's not going to be necessary in the next age. That's a, that's a revelation we didn't have up until this point, which makes the Sadducee scenario a moot point. There's no need for marriage in the, next, in the new heaven and new earth. And then Jesus ends on this, and this is where I'll end. Jesus quotes Exodus chapter 3, where God is speaking from the burning bush, and he says that I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When God was speaking in the book of Exodus, uh, Exodus chapter 3, and Jesus is quoting this, this is something remarkable. He uses the present tense to refer that he is the God of Abra uh, Abraham, uh, Jacob, and Isaac. These men had been dead hundreds of years by the time Exodus chapter 3 was uh, happening. God speaks as though they're alive and well somewhere just waiting. And that is exactly what the, fair, the Sadducees miss, is that Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob are waiting. You notice God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. I am the God. Like, he is existing somewhere. And from Jesus' perspective, the fact that they're alive and well waiting somewhere is that they are waiting for the resurrected body and jesus logic that all works my takeaway here and this is where i end your view of god and what he can or cannot do in this in this life will always in some sense be tied to your knowledge of scripture and your obedience to it We're going to pick up uh, the story uh, later in the day as Jesus is um, leaving the temple. And you can see he's been talking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and straightening them out. Well, don't think that the disciples are going to get off easy. And so in uh, Mark chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, we see this. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples <laughs> said to him, Look, teacher. What massive stones, what magnificent buildings. And Jesus replied, Do you see these things, these great buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. So there's a couple of things that we can see here. You know, Chad last week demonstrated for us how beautiful and how large, majestic the temple was. 
on massive stones were laid end to end and carefully stacked upon one another. The temple was a magnificent structure, easily the most beautiful building in Jerusalem. No matter where you went in the city, you could see the temple in all of its glory. And the disciples, they were impressed by the size, the beauty, by everything that the temple had. They wanted Jesus to see the temple as they did. And what Jesus did was come alongside them and wanted them to see the temple the way he did. On the outside, the temple was polished marble, glistening and shining. But on the inside, it was characterized by corruption, hypocrisy, and the hard hearts of the Jewish religious leaders. And there's a couple of things that we can glean from these two verses. And the first is, Jesus wanted the disciples to see the temple or its rituals were not the way to save them. Once when Jesus was dealing with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, he told them, And truly, one is here who is greater than the temple. Because our salvation is not and should not be put in anyone or anything other than Jesus. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We need to put our faith, we need to put our hope in Jesus and not in the things that we can build or accumulate or do or accomplish. The next thing that we see is that God sees differently than we do. Even all the way back in the Old Testament lets us know that. In 1 Samuel it says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now the heart is used in Scripture as the most comprehensive term for the real, authentic person. It's made up of his will, desires, passions, thoughts, ambitions, understanding, will. That's all wrapped up in the term heart. This is a great reminder for us not to get caught up in the glitz and the glamour and the red carpet of life and all that it has to offer. God's not impressed by what we can accomplish or what we can do or what we've achieved. He doesn't look at statures or how smart or how successful someone has been. All of those are on the outside. God cares about the changes that we make to our heart. He cares about the changes that we make to our motives. He cares about the changes that we make in our thoughts so that they are in tune with God. So Jesus wraps up leaving the temple, trying to get his disciples to see things as he did. And that's the message for you and me today also, is that don't look as the world looks. Look as God sees things. It's matters of the heart. Tuesday has been a very busy day uh, in the life of Jesus. And, and don't forget, Jesus is on his way to be murdered. He's on his way to the cross, and he knows exactly what's happening. And so um, we, we go back, we, we take a step back real quick, and, and Jesus is teaching another group, or it's the same group, and different people are kind of coming in um, to, to talk to him, to challenge him. And there's actually, in Mark chapter 12, and verse 28, there's one, one scribe who who kind of walks up on the situation. Maybe he's, he's been a part of the group, or I don't know if, where, but the, but the scripture says he kind of comes up on what's happening, and he's listening. Um, and and he's, he listens to, to all of Jesus' answers, and it says in scripture that, that he is, he's kind of, he's floored by, by what he has said. Um, and and Mark, seems to, Mark seems to paint him in a, in, in a little bit of a, of, of a good light, that he's really concerned about what's going on. And there was a song that we, we sang earlier, um, in our worship time, and, and, and there's a phrase in there, and it says this, it says, show me who you are, and fill me with your heart, and lead me in your love to those around me, and the writer of that song, I think, is, is, is kind of captures what Jesus is going to, Jesus' answer to a question that's about to come, and, and it 
It says this in Mark chapter 12, verse, verses 30 and 31. It says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I know some of you right now are in your mind. You're doing the motions that Lisa taught you. <laughs> and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. And so Jesus is, he's in this religious world, and he's in this complex where it's really all about, and it was, wasn't, meant, wasn't created for this, but it's turned into religion, and it's turned into rules. And he was asked by this scribe, he was asked, what was the greatest commandment of all the commandments? Jesus, if you're gonna if you're gonna choose one, what would you choose? And it's interesting because um, all of these other, as I said earlier, all of these other religions, you heard from the guys, all these other religious leaders are trying to entrap him. They're trying to find out a way, as, as Chad said earlier, they're trying to find a way to kill him. They want to stop him. They want they want to shut him up. Even people who had absolutely nothing in common as far as beliefs, they were willing to to drop all that so they could figure out how to make sure that they could stop Jesus. But Mark tells us that this scribe is, as I said earlier, is really impressed by what Jesus has to say. And maybe he was in the camp to say, I, I want to entrap him. I want to stop him. But what Jesus has been talking about has really been, been working on him. And, and there's something that, about Jesus' answers that, that, that's really intrigued him. And so he, he, comes, he comes to him. And so Jesus answers his question, because his question is, which command is the most important of them all? And, and he, answers, he answers his question not with one command, but he gives him two. And with those two that he says, he, he says that, because the question was asked, which was the greatest commandment? But he says that, that they're equal. Matter of fact, in Matthew's gospel, where, where he, Matthew's recording the, the same conversation, Matthew says that all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So everything else comes from these two. These two are the main thing. And I'm not sure. I'm not really sure what he expected to hear. Uh, again, there, there were 613 of them. You heard that from from uh, Chad earlier. And and I think in the midst of all these commands, what was lost to everyone, that what was lost in the main thing, Jesus reminds them of it here. Jesus said that the greatest commandment is this. It's love. All your rules, all your religion, all the things that you're doing, it's not, those aren't, those pale in comparison to love. Love for God and love for your neighbor. And I know some people would argue, wait a minute, shouldn't, shouldn't the love for God be the greatest? I mean, there, there really should be no other, right? That should be at the top of the list. But what Jesus is saying here to us is he's saying the love for God, this one one of these flows from the other. I believe you can't say that you love God and then hate your neighbor. They don't jive. In all the doing that we do for God, we, we can't forget the greatest commandment that he gave us. And when he says to love, I think he, he's reminding the people to love the way that he loved. Because love means being selfless, being sacrificial, being a servant being a light in dark places, being an example for others to follow, being a verbal witness, and it means letting God be Lord. If you continue to read on in that passage there in chapter 12, you, you, you get to see the scribe's response, because this guy, he, he's responding to God, and I don't know if he's in the group talking or if this has become a one-on-one, -on -one, but the scribe says to him, uh, in, in, starting in verse 32, it says, you're right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one and there is no no one else except him and to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. So this scribe, this scribe knew it. He knew it. He, and, and he agreed with Jesus. But listen to how Jesus responded to him in that last verse, verse 34. He says, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, why didn't, why did Jesus choose to say that? Because basically Jesus said, you're close. You're close. So what was he missing? Why did Jesus say that, that you're not, you're, you're not far, you're almost there. You're, you're right there. What was he missing? I think what he was missing at this point in time, was committing his life to loving 
and following Christ. You see, because as a scribe, he, was, he had all the knowledge in the world. He was a rule follower. But you know what he wasn't yet? He wasn't a Christ follower. You see, it's more than just agreeing with Jesus or accepting his teachings. It means answering Jesus' call to follow him. What really matters What what, what is the thing that matters? That's what we've been talking about this whole morning. What really matters to God? It's not not our religion. It's not all the rules that we follow. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that's lived out in obedience to his call in our lives. And so my question this morning to you as we close out is this. Are you close Or are you all in? See, Jesus is calling for you for that relationship, a relationship that he's initiating with you, and in a relationship that he will show these people in Scripture just a few days later what he means by that when he goes to the cross. Religion doesn't matter. What you know, it's it's important, but it's not the most important thing. It's what you do with what you know. Are we close? Are we all in? Because a relationship with God, that's, that's what counts.